Hey everyone and welcome back to the Warcraft news. So, while we usually do the WoW news on Saturdays, well, this stuff is very much going down right now. It's quite the change and it's in your video game. Now ask anyone who is not thrilled about 8.3, and you will get a bunch of answers, but as our survey, uh, survey from back then does show, well, much of it was about corruption. It was about account-wide essence. It was about player agency. Well, Blizzard are making big moves on live to, you know what, revamp the game. That's how it's going to feel, right? They're essentially cutting out massive swathes of RNG and they're providing a catch-up mechanism for all of those new characters that people have been XP boosting up. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a pity things like this didn't work, or things didn't work like this back in January, eh? <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating, right? Like, they did the same thing with Legion. You know, Legion Legendary Acquisition was totally random. For me, that was one of the worst parts of Legion. It drove me nuts. I mean, before people really, like, sort of ticked off about it around 7-1, I made a video hypercritical of it. It got dislike bombed into oblivion, or not really, I think it was like 20% dislikes, but, uh, you know... That ended up being something that people were frustrated by, and then Blizzard just gave people a currency to let them work towards the legendary that they wanted. But it sure was a pity that that only came in after the Legos were no longer useful, and, you know, because Legion was essentially over. So, I really hope here that Blizzard are thinking about why direct systems like this, even if they are maybe a bit slow to earn, feel better to many players than the RNG-based ones of the last while. And you know what? I'm gonna sort of say this. I think they may have learned, because it seems that Shadowlands Legendaries are purchased with a currency that you earn in Torghast with a weekly cap, and that you can just buy the effects you want in the order of your choosing. So yes, corruption may indeed be the end of the RNG domination. That said, Blizzard kind of did in a way that got a fair few people a bit ticked off because, well, people who, um, you know, worked on their rank three essences first when they actually came out initially have kind of been messed up a little bit. Why? Well, it's because this whole thing, this whole redesigned system is using Echoes of Nihilotha, the account-wide-ish essence catch-up system. And yes, that means that we do have a lot to dive into today. New announcement, okay? New announcement. This is pretty cool. The daily briefing is going live. Each day, our gaming news team for our other channel, yeah, we have another channel, it condenses all the game industry news into one big everything you need to know TLDR post. That is live today, and it will be every weekday going forward. We're always trying to, you know, like work out what we can do to actually bring you more content, so that's uh, that's the next step. And also, it's the Paladin Pin pre-order this month. Uh, here is the Mage and uh, Priest ones as references, and of course, this awesome concept from our, our games, our studio's art team, uh, some big chunky art pack, and also so, you know, vlogs, BTS, Jared's big WoW weekly post he does every uh, every week. There's a lot going on from the team, and if you'd like to learn about why I've been saying pin pre-order, and while I'll very soon no longer be saying pre-order, and uh, just, I guess, the early window into the virus that we got, and the impact in supply chains and some of that BTS stuff, stick around at the end of the video. I think you might find it a little bit interesting or revealing. Anyway, let's get into it. So, Remember the Echoes of Nihilotha system the Blizzard added into the game a while back. Now, the core of that is if you had rank 3 essences on a main, but you know, you didn't have them in your alt, then doing just about any content on that alt, what would that do? It would earn you those Echoes of Nihilotha. And then once your alt, you know, no longer had ones to get, uh, they'd stop earning the Echoes of Nihilotha. That's kind of like how it worked. So, Blizzard has decided to do even more with that currency. It's in the game right now, and it's a pretty massive system. So... Mother sells corruptions. She straight up sells them. You get corruptions, they go in your bag, you can click on them and apply them to a bit of gear, just like they're an enchant. Insane. <laughs> Once this, uh, you know, well, this stuff's kicked off now, but yeah, you'll earn Echoes of Nihilotha regardless of your essence status or anything. It'll just be a currency you'll get. And uh, yeah, you can purchase uh, corruptions, you can purchase uh, vessels of horrific visions as well. Now, since Echoes of Nihilotha come from, I mean, just about anything you do at Endgame, including Mythic Plus, raids, and PvP, it actually means you can do horrific visions without having to do the world content if you so choose. It also means that, I mean, yeah, you can just do more visions if you want as well, which is pretty sweet. Now, the choice to reuse the Echoes of Nihilotha currency 
I mean, I get how Blizzard want an elegant single currency system, but it has presented a few issues for them. Now, their solution to that problem, I think it's, it does function, but it does leave some players who stuck by the game feeling a little bit burnt. So, I mean, it's weird, right? Blizzard felt the need to do a soft reset of that currency. Now, rather than do that by just resetting everybody to zero and giving you some gold in the mail like they did with Titan Residuum, they have instead decided to increase the amount that you earn by five times and then to increase the cost of items by five times. So if you're a new fresh player, the whole thing balances out. But of course, it's a nerf to the effectiveness of past Echo's gains. And really here, the thing is that it's a strange halfway house, right? So loads of players, they've already got loads of Echoes of Nihilotha kind of by accident over the last the last bunch of weeks, right? Now, those people have unknowingly been farming for this system, as it would turn out. Now, to actually understand what they would have earned by that unknowing farming, let's take a quick look at the new costs. So here's Blizzard's sample table of Mother's Wares. Oddly enough, right, the RNG's not gone here because her stock of, I think, six corruptions a day, that change, or sorry, her stock of six corruptions will change twice per week whenever the assaults flip over. So yeah, you get like 12 a week, basically. And that is a bit strange. I guess they don't want just everybody saving up and just getting Twilight Devastation or the Appendage one or maybe the Gushing Wound one, the latter of which they've actually nerfed. Yes, they've nerfed, nerfed a Gushing Wound. And the reason there, right, is because it was lots of damage per corruption. It was efficient. So it was great for squeezing in a little bit more corruption before you hit your next breakpoint. So now being able to do that with Gushing Wound was like a pretty niche thing based on RNG. I was lucky to be able to do it. But with a vendor, it's more accessible. So they've nerfed it. Anyway, right? A rank 3 essence will cost you 2,500, while a vessel of horrific visions is 1,750. As for the corruptions, well, the terrible ones like Masterful 1 cost 3,000, and the crazy ones like Twilight Devastation 3 cost 15,000. Now, to put that in terms that you'll maybe understand from having played the game recently, getting Twilight Devastation 3 will take about as much effort as it would take to earn 6 rank 3 essences. So that's basically what that's like. Okay, let's get back to the players who have unknowingly been grinding this system kind of accidentally for over a month, just getting those echoes and not spending them. Well, many of those people will be able to purchase great stuff in day one. Now, many players will have felt that's unfair, right? Because, you know, the arbitrary requirements of the older echoes of Nihilotha system, that because of that, they've missed out on being, you know, maybe a week ahead or two weeks ahead. But conversely, if Blizzard wiped the board clean, then the worry would be that people would maybe feel hard done by, even though, of course, they farmed that currency accidentally. Now, Blizzard's five times inflation appears to be an attempt to strike a middle ground between both interest groups. And because of that, it is just a little bit awkward. But that's what I've got to wonder, you know, is it reasonable to have acquired a bunch of this currency essentially accidentally, not knowing about this system, and then being unhappy with a reset? I'm not really sure if that many people would be peeved off there. I mean, like if getting, you know, Echoes wasn't an act of gold because all the essences have been like, you know what I mean, right? But I guess then there is one very clear problem that absolutely will have cropped up for people and screwed them over. And that is, if you had a bunch of Echoes and then you haven't purchased your rank three essences, yeah, you're going to log in and you're find, you know, you'll find that those costs have increased by 5x. And that's going to feel terrible. And it will happen to people. It will have happened because... Blizzard communicated this, like, what, one day, two days before it went live in NA? And I don't think that was enough lead time. Now, as for my take for this, I'm actually really happy with it. Broad strokes. More player agency, less RNG. That is just fantastic. The means are a bit awkward. Yeah, I mean, would it have been too much to just do a new currency for the corruptions? I mean, that would have been the one with the least complications in terms of fairness and balance. But that said, the currency bloat of 8.3 would have gone a little out of hand there. Um, so, you know, cleaner in some ways, messier in others. Blizzard, they could have just decided to do a reset like with Titan Residuum or maybe a 10x inflation instead to make that, you know, a bit more extreme. I mean, actually, like, given the reasoning for their Titan Residuum change in 8.3, I've got to wonder if the reason why they held back in this announcement so close to it being implemented is because they didn't want to, like, dare people to farm up Echoes inefficiently. But anyway, as Wowhead Squishy points out, the parallels to this and the waking essences of Legion really is quite funny. Now, on, on that, like, whole topic, though, let's talk about this weird thing of Blizzard making their game far better, but after it matters. This is one of the most crazy patterns of behavior that Blizzard display. And I'm just, you know, I always think to myself, what if this was just here from day one, right? The Echoes of Nihilotha, 
they essentially would have been valor points of 8-3, right? You know, you would have got them from doing the harder content in the game, and they would have then went into making your character more powerful. Players would have had far more agency in what they actually did with the corruption system. They maybe could have actually played with the corruption system, and they could have been far more able to actually tailor their character's corruption levels. I mean, seriously, what if gear did not drop with corruptions at all, but gear, or, you know, but like bosses dropped these echoes of Nihilotha? Uh, or something like that. And, you know, you were kind of going in and, and doing the corruption yourself. Or maybe what if, you know, whenever you cleanse the night and you got some echoes back because you removed the corruption from it, there could have been loads of like interplays and stuff going on with this system. Although I guess I will admit that if you could, right, like if you could just cleanse a bit of corrupted gear to get some echoes, then people could kind of infinitely farm that, which could, you know, lead to some degenerate gameplay, which is maybe not how they'd want to design the game. So a little bit tricky to balance there, but I think you get my point, right? If this was embraced from day one, it would have been way better for the patch. And, you know, it's something weird, right? Like Blizzard said that a goal of this system was customizing your corruption, but that didn't really work out because of the RNG. So imagine if A3 launched with this. It would have been incredible. You could have, you know, worked towards something and just earned it right? And then you could have played around with your corruptions to get different builds. And that certainly would have made me more likely to put my time into the game. Because as it stood, I really wanted to do some raiding with the new guild I was with. And, uh, you know, what I did was bare minimum to get heroic curve and that's it. Why? Well, the chances of the game's layers of RNG dicking me over were so high that WoW was no longer a sensible place to put my recreational time. So I was just driven by get curve and that was it. You know, now things wouldn't have been perfect, right? And if this was an uncapped system, it could have had some, you know, it could have just dared some serious overgrinding. But I think you get the point, though. Fundamentally, I think it would have been far, far better for the health of the game and of 8.3. Now, there is one strange part of all of this as well. If an item is being cleansed, then it can no longer be corrupted manually through this new system. Now, that kind of sucks. And Blizzard admitted that it's not ideal and that it is a technical hurdle that they're trying to overcome. But they did say, right, that they, you know, they understand it's a problem, but they didn't want to delay implementing the system in order to fix it. And I think that does make sense. And I think it also just does show how much this whole thing deviates from the original way these systems were designed. You know, this, to me, it seems like a bit of Shadowlands thinking seeping into BFA. I mean, as I said at the top of the video, you know, Shadowlands legendaries are kind of analogous to some of this stuff, uh, at least in terms of player power. And, you know, they're earned by getting a weekly capped currency and then spending it on the effect that you want. That's kind of similar to here, not with a cap, but you get my point. Now, if this represents learning from Blizz, then I am all, all for it. Now, there is a final change. Each level of the cloak rank upgrade now only takes one run. Now, the ones past rank 15, that still works the same system, uh, but still, the point here is that you can get your cloak mostly up to power quite a lot faster than you could have previously, which totally is a good thing for all of those new, uh, new alts that are being rolled. On the whole, then, I would say that in spite of the messiness with the currency, I do think this is a very good change for the game. You will just be in more control over how you grow your character, and that is great. Now, it's not to the degree where the game is, you know, boring or very straightforward or anything like that, but it is to the degree where the major frustrations of bad RNG are gone. This just, to me, fundamentally seems like a better design, and it should have been there when 8.3 launched. I keep on sort of thinking here, Blizzard, with the Legendaries of Legion, with these corruptions, your catch-up system ended up being a better design system than the one you shipped. Maybe Shadowlands will show that they actually now understand that. So, there you go. That is basically the situation here. Um, this is great, all right? It seriously is great. This is good parts of Shadowlands coming into the current game. I think that 8.3 now, you know, this actually changes some of what I would say about if you should come back to WoW, because... I mean, yeah, if, if you just want to get some goals done with your friends, there's now more interesting systems. You can now far more viably play around with corruption. This makes corruption a better system because you've got more control over, uh, over it. It is just far better. Uh, yeah, I mean, man, why not earlier? Bit weird, but that's basically where we're at. Now, I did say that I would explain to, to everybody why, you know, as an example, right, this was March, this mage pin, and this one was April, and, you know, I'd had to say pre-order for, for so long. Uh, and the reason why, of course, is the virus. And because, and just if you're not aware, the whole process uh, of manufacturing pins 
um, you know, like if you actually look at these, you know, these are forged like metal, you know, 3D objects. And then somebody's actually got to go in and like do the enamel and everything. It's like a pretty involved process. And, uh, you know, just because of the way markets work, you know, if, if you were doing these in the UK or something like that, it would, uh, you know, basically would be in, impossible to work. Uh, so yeah, that's something that is is done over in China. And what's really interesting about that is because, you know, that's where the virus actually started, right? That's where it all blew up uh, in the beginning. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've kind of known that this thing was pretty serious, pretty bad, pretty early. Now, it's not like the situation where doctors on the ground knew about this in, you know, in early December and very unfortunately were silenced. Um, but thankfully, you know, those that experience in like the, the early December, it seems to have at least meant that there's some countries like Taiwan that were able to get an incredible uh, handle on the, uh, on the situation. And, you know, Taiwan is a separate democratic country. It is not a province of, uh, the, of, of the People's Republic. Come on now. Anyway, anyway. So, uh, yeah, right. Because of that, though, I mean, there was just some basic logistics going on, right? Where, you know, we had done the very first... Ah, I don't have any sitting around me, but we did pins of our channel logo. Uh, we did that in November, if memory serves. Was it October? No, I think it was November. So we done that. And then we just kind of thought, wow, these turned out incredibly we, you know, this is, this is great. This is a great working relationship. Fantastic. Wonderful. So we then got really hyped in the idea of doing these pins. And then we announced, you know, January, it's going to be the hunter and that's great. We get the design in, in December. And then what happens, right? Right at the end of the manufacturing of, of the process, I don't have a hunter pin near me either, but right at the end of the hunters uh, being made, that is when Lunar New Year was extended. Uh, so, you know, we could have got it into them, you know, through to them a bit, a bit quicker ourselves, but yeah, like the Lunar New Year being extended was like the initial response, it seems. So it was I kind of like that point we, we realized like, oh, right, stuff really is getting shut down. And I guess the scope of, of things that were going on, uh, I think people who are, you know, just working with, working with, you know, people who are in that country just kind of realized like earlier than I think the media would have realized what was going on because like we quite literally felt it. Um, and then I guess from, you know, from my perspective, um, biology was my thing. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, my, my like first, uh, you know, like I think it was like most of my first choices and stuff for university were going into, I mean, it was various, you know, between biology, biomedical science, stuff like that. So that was like my sort of initial path. So I guess it was like being interested in that stuff anyway, seeing what was going on there, seeing, you know, the, the likelihood of, of spread. You know, I'm no way claiming to be, uh, you know, some epidemiologist. There's a lot of, you know, backseat epidemiologists on, on Twitter and stuff, and it's a little bit embarrassing. But it was certainly enough that I was like, oh, wow, that is... That is scary how that could go statistically. And yeah, basically what ended up happening there, and this is something that has be, been experienced quite a lot, but it's quite interesting because a lot of customers won't have experienced this as much. And that's because of just interesting ways of how global supply chains work. So for us, because this is a thing where, you know, we put in the order, we get it, we do our QC, we do all, do all of our stuff, you know, so after we've, you know, done the design and all that, uh, and then it goes out to you guys, right? now. For something like that, it really hit us hard because it's not like we had done these massively all in advance. Uh, and that meant that even when the factories came back up online, which was what, a month and a half, something like that, maybe a month after Lunar New Year, they had massive backlogs, like two month backlogs, six week backlogs, everything was slower. And then global shipping was way slower. Now, the reason why you as a customer in like other fields may have not seen that as much is because of kind of how retail works. So you've got a whole bunch of stages in this process where you're going to have the distributor and then it goes to the retailer. So, you know, stuff will come into the, the regional distributor through the global supply chain and then it will go out. Now, a lot of those distributors will actually, they'll carry decently high floats of, um, you know, of parts. So that's why, like, you know, if you wanted, like, RAM or CPUs or stuff, yeah, like, a lot of them actually still had lots of stuff in stock. And generally, you know, those things are, like, those supply chains are sort of designed so the disruptions and hitches 
uh, are sort of taken into account and there's like a buffer. So yeah, that's that's kind of like what explains that difference and why for the longest time we had to say pin pre-order. Um, now that said, right, we do have the next two months in production now and we are about to get the next two or three months. Uh, so that does mean that for most of the rest of this year, I won't have to say pre-order, right? Because the whole, you know, supply chain situation uh, should have caught back up, assuming, you know, there are no second waves or anything like that. But what it certainly has done for us is it certainly has meant that, yeah, we're way more on it in terms of getting this stuff done earlier because, I mean, yeah, I'm, like, it sucks that, I, you know, we've had to be, like, pre-order, you know, because <laughs> we're excited about these things. We want to be able to show them to you, uh, actually, you know, in a, you know, what you see is what you get situation. So that's been, that's been pretty unfortunate. But, yeah, we're getting there. And I guess that's uh, a little bit of a look into behind the scenes of what all, uh, just what all that stuff, uh, I suppose, is like. It's an interesting, unprecedented situation, but uh, yeah, there you go. That's kind of our slice of things. And I guess just a bit of an update, bit of texture, context of what's going on. And then the reason, of course, why that hasn't happened, you know, with prints and stuff like that, is that's all done in the UK, right? So that's not being, uh, not being impacted in the same manner. So... There you go. That is it. Uh, that is it for us. If you've, uh, I guess, stuck along for this post video preamble or pre, I don't think you can do a post video preamble. This uh, post video ramble explanation, then uh, thanks, I guess. I hope you found it uh, interesting and maybe just enlightening about what the, the overall situation is. But anyway, that's it for me. Thank you for watching today's video. And with that, I will see you next time.